Okay, so uh, thanks uh, so much uh, for inviting me to speak in this workshop. And uh, I'm also sorry for the, the difficult circumstances. And you know, thanks for all the online participants for uh, tuning in. Um, so uh, today I, I will uh, talk to you about uh, algorithms for, for integer programming um, and uh, the relation to uh, a conjecture of Kanan-Novas in the in the 80s that would imply faster algorithms for integer programming. And um, at a high level, what 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 I'll tell you about um, is first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, is, is going to be a, a very high level sketch of um, what's going on with, with IP uh, algorithms in terms of just the, the highest level view. Um, then um, as some character building, and, and because, I mean, for me, these are, these are fundamental, I'm going to tell you a little bit about sort of lattice algorithms, um, which are going to form the kind of key components um, for implementing the um, IP algorithms. Um, and then I'll spend a lot of time on explaining the sort of min-max relation for, for the covering radius um, and how that um, implies um, algorithmic bounds for integer programming. Uh, and last, I will very likely not get to this. Um, we, th there has been uh, uh, progress on, on this conjecture of Kanan Lobos in special cases, um, and uh, I might uh, talk about that. But if I talk about that, that means you guys didn't ask enough questions, uh, so hopefully I don't get all the way to the end. Um, okay, so what's the, the problem? Uh, we want to solve uh, an integer linear program. Um, we want to minimize the linear function over the integer points inside um, uh, an LP. Um, and uh, this is clearly one of the most basic uh, problems in discrete optimization. You can model sort of all of your favorite problems with this. And the focus of this talk is just going to be uh, what is the complexity of solving this problem as a function of n. Um, and so from the, the FPT standpoint, uh, we want to know, you know, what is the FPT and N um, um, kind of complexity. Um, so this, uh, let me just, no, sorry. Okay. Um, and sort of the theme, sort of highlight of what hopefully you'll see in this talk is that Trying to solve this problem and get faster algorithms for this problem is really kind of a mix of adventures in uh, the sort of geometry of lattices uh, and uh, general convex geometry. So, uh, in some sense, to really understand the material of this talk, you kind of need to take uh, classes in both, you know, that might be a semester long course. So, I'm not going to be able to prove very much in this talk, but I will try and draw lots of uh, pretty pictures. So, hopefully, you can get, you know, some high level ideas. Um, and wow. Okay, so uh, what do we know? So first I just want to write down what the fastest uh, algorithm uh, that, that we currently know of. Um, and in essence, uh, the, the algorithm has sort of polynomial dependence uh, in all the basic things associated with an LP. Um, and then you have a very large uh, dependence on the number of variables. Um, and the key term here is sort of n to the n. Okay. Um, and uh, one of the biggest open questions uh, in the area is whether you can make n to the n 2 to the n. Okay, so this, this is uh, also kind of the motivation for uh, uh, the, the conjecture that, that I want to talk about. Um, so there, there's definitely been some progress uh, since the beginning. So the first algorithm uh, for solving IP was due to uh, Hendrik Lenstra in the 80s, and he was the first to kind of mix techniques from lattices with uh, IP. Um, and then uh, uh, Kanan sort of enhanced this, this connection and, and showed how to solve uh, lots of basic lattice problems exactly, uh, and uh, uh, quite substantially improved the complexity of IP. 
Uh, and then since then, I would say, you know, we've mostly been slowly, uh, very slowly, uh, decreasing the constant in the exponent. Um, but hopefully, I'll try and convince you that uh, there is at least a pathway um, to doing better. Um, and I'm going to put this on, 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 on the next slide. So actually, in terms of how you should like interpret these complexities, it's really um, um, how many subproblems like these algorithms are all sort of recursive. It's sort of how many subproblems do I need to solve per dimension? Right. So uh, all of these sort of complexities are sort of saying I can somehow break my IP into a polynomial and n number of subproblems at every step. And if you multiply that all together, you get a branching tree where you have n to the n uh, sort of nodes in the tree, or n to the, the order n uh, nodes in the tree. Uh, and that's where these complexities come from. Okay, so what if we want to do better? Um, so here's a conjecture. Uh, the goal of this talk is going to explain why this conjecture is meaningful. So, so it's not obviously key or why the conjecture should be meaningful. Um, but here it is in sort of the simplest uh, possible form. Um, and it's the following. It says if I have uh, a convex set, okay, uh, and it doesn't contain integer points. So here you have two convex sets. This is an infinite band. This is a triangle. Neither of them contains integer points. Then what can I uh, uh, conclude, or what can I hopefully conclude? Um, it's that I can find a, a sort of matrix, an integer matrix, um, with some number of rows, I'm not sure how many, um, such that the rank of the matrix is, is exactly the number of rows, and the volume of the projection of K is small. So in this context, so let's say I have this infinite band, I can sort of project onto the x-axis. This thing in full space, an infinite band has infinite volume in full space, right? But if I project it onto the x-axis, then the volume is less than one. Okay. Um, and here I have this big triangle, um, and you can convince yourself, I mean, okay, here are many different things would work, but already the triangle itself uh, has small volume. Uh, so, you know, the projection, you could pick it to be the identity, right? So, so depending on the body, sort of different dimensions of projections might be needed. And the key thing is that these are integer projections. So, uh, as I said, the, the focus of this talk is going to try and explain, like, why this is meaningful. Um, and, you know, how do you, uh, how could you possibly use this for, for IP? Uh, and in particular, a sort of suitably algorithmic version of this would imply like a log n to the n time for our IP, which is certainly better than n to the n. Uh, it's not quite two to the order n, that I admit I have no clue how to get to, uh, but, but uh, log n to the n is something you could hope for at least directly from these, these approaches. Okay. So, uh, what is, yes? Is there a lower bound for this log n that you cannot do better in this context? Yes, yes. It's actually, it's extremely simple. It's a simplex. I can, I can even you, have it. Uh, can you go back? Yes. So you said something about integer, in, integer projections. I didn't understand. Why ah, the matrix is, is integer. Ah, oh, well, all right. Yeah, yeah. It's key that the matrix is integer. Otherwise, you could just scale down, right? Yes, you could do all sorts of things. Yes, yes. So, so it's very important that the matrix is integer, and that is. That means that integers come are mapped to integers. That's integers important. map to integers. That's that's really crucial, uh, indeed. And there is like a general lattice version of this, but I I, I won't fully write it. So I'm worried then later. Um. Okay. Yeah, maybe Daniel. Can I also ask? Yes. So if you go back, so this is now like a, so this, this bound includes the volume. Yes. Whereas where there, when I think about like flatness, it's more like, I don't know, how many lattice hyperplanes or how many yes. uh, integer fibers do I need to? Yes. Is there like, uh, is, is this the most natural thing you would put or? or? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so, so it turns out that the flatness that you know, no, yep. I mean, I'll have a picture of this maybe, uh, is exactly what happens when you set D to be one. Yes. Um, and already sort of flatness, there, there, there is a discrepancy between like number of hyperplanes and width. Mm -hmm. um, and 
this is somehow the discrepancy between volume and counting integer points. And I'll, I'll yeah, kind of get into that a little bit. Good, great, thanks. Okay. Um, all right, so what is the, the, the very high level anatomy of like all of these kind of IP algorithms? Um, so now we're just gonna focus on the, the feasibility question. Um, and in fact, it turns out that it doesn't really matter um, like what the, at least for the algorithms I'm going to describe, what the representation is of uh, your, your IP. So I can just kind of say the feasible region is some convex set that I have uh, something like a separation oracle for, or oracle access to. Um, and essentially all the algorithms don't really care. Um, it just, you know, it'll lose you an additional polynomial factor, excuse me. Um, but uh, I mean, in some sense, yeah, this is, this is perhaps a weakness that, that, you know, if I told you you had a small number of inequalities, I actually don't know how to use that information. Um, okay, so uh, what do we want to do? We either want to find uh, an integer point uh, that happens to be uh, inside my feasible region, uh, or I want to decide that there are none. Okay, so that's the problem. Now, as I said, we're moving to feasibility. Um, and they're really only kind of two steps. Um, you know, one is uh, you're basically going to look at your feasible region and, oh, I see. Uh, there is a center here, which uh, for those of you in the audience, you can't see it because uh, it's the wrong color for this screen. Um, <laughs> but there is a center here. And uh, yes, I guess you can see it on the other screen. Um, and in essence, you want to choose like some, some nice center deep inside the body, okay? And this is not going to be uh, integral, but you're going to try and round it to an integer point. Uh, and the hope is like, okay, if your body is somehow big enough, uh, this will work uh, and you will find your, 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 your integer point inside K. Okay? Um, and sort of if it isn't, so uh, if your body isn't big enough uh, for the rounding procedure to work, then you'll be able to somehow uh, chop your body up into lower dimensional pieces. Um, in this case, it's two hyperplanes, um, and you will recurse on uh, both of these hyperplanes. Okay, and essentially the complexity of the algorithm will roughly be uh, like how many chunks do I need to recurse on at every step? Right. So this is uh, the very sort of high-level outline. Um, so what I'm going to talk about now is I'm going to uh, move to um, sort of lattice algorithms, which are how you implement the different steps. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, what is a lattice? So the most basic lattice is the one you already know. It's just uh, all the integer points. That's in some sense the, the proto uh, lattice. Um, but if you uh, want to look a bit further, what a lattice is, is just a linear transformation of the integers. So instead of having like the basis be, you know, the standard unit vectors, um, you have your basis being any linearly independent set of vectors. And so then you get this kind of regular uh, type of grid, uh, but it's just not an orthogonal grid. Um, and uh, you should note that here is one basis for, for this lattice. So the lattice is all the integer combinations of the basis, um, but you should note that there are many, many different uh, bases that give you uh, the same lattice. Uh, and in fact, this is pretty crucial in the algorithms that you know, some bases are nicer than others, uh, usually in terms of you know, the lengths of the basis vectors being long or short. Um, uh, another fundamental quantity uh, is the, the determinant of the lattice. Um, and uh, many of you will have seen this as sort of the volume of like this parallel pipette formed by uh, any basis. But sort of more generally, this determinant is uh, the volume of any region that tiles space with respect to the lattice. And that's actually usually a better way of thinking about it. Um, and so uh, any region that tiles space with respect to the lattice will in fact have exactly the same volume. Um, okay. Uh, and there is uh, another lattice, uh, which um, for those of you who have ever studied lattices, you should know and love, uh, which is the dual. Uh, and the dual lattice is sort of all the points 
that have integer inner products with everybody in the lattice. Okay. Um, and these uh, you should think of as kind of indexing like hyperplanes that your lattice points live on. So if I have like a dual lattice vector, I can break up uh, the original lattice into kind of hyperplanes with respect to uh, the inner possible inner products with uh, y. So since the inner products are all supposed to be integral, you know, you have y, every single lattice point will live on one of these. Okay. Um, and the other thing I should mention is you have this kind of somewhat magical identity that is uh, sort of uh, algebraically trivial, but, but sort of geometrically less trivial. Uh, that in fact, you know, things flip when you go from the lattice to the dual lattice, in particular, uh, determinants are reciprocal. Um, okay. Uh, oh, and another useful thing in this particular picture, this picture will come back, uh, is that if you look at the like minimal spacing sort of in between two of these uh, hyperplanes, this is exactly like one over the length of, uh, of the, the vector y, uh, and that will, will come up uh, later, sort of helps you figure out, yeah, like how big these spacings are is, is sort of a useful thing to know. Um, and when you're starting with the integer lattice, you know, lots of things uh, happen in general in, in optimization and particular lattices, where if you start with Zn, sometimes you don't realize that some statements that you're making are really about the dual lattice, and some statements you're making are really about the lattice. And the reason is that in the context of Zn, it's self-dual, so the dual of Zn is Zn itself. Okay, but in general, this is not the case, and this is useful to kind of keep in mind from time to time. Um, and so, uh, sort of motivated by like IP, we're going to look at uh, sort of problems on lattices that will deal with norms of things, and these norms will be general. Um, and they'll be general essentially because the, the feasible region of an IP is general. So to kind of tame, I mean, to, to model the same complexity um, as you have in IP, we're going to really work with completely uh, general norms. And so here I have a norm that's induced by uh, a symmetric convex body K. Um, and the way you think of a norm is just the norm of a vector is how much I need to scale the body until uh, the point is just on the bound. Okay? Um, and this view is sort of equivalent to having all of these nice properties, triangle inequality, homogeneity, uh, symmetry, etc. Um, if I uh, ask, if I get rid of this last assumption, which you'll see at some point uh, is, is relevant for us, um, then I will actually be dealing with uh, non-symmetric, uh, possibly uh, convex body here. Um, and uh, I can still define sort of everything in the same way. Um, these kind of properties will still hold, uh, but clearly symmetry doesn't hold. So like x and minus x do not have the same size. Um, and this is, again, this lack of symmetry will basically be because, or will be motivated by the fact that in IP, uh, your feasible region is not symmetric. Um, OK, so you know our favorite norms that, that everyone should be uh, like happy and familiar with, you have you know, the different LP norms in terms of their geometry. You have the unit balls being you know, the, the standard ball, the box, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the only object uh, additional that I, I, I want to define um, are ellipsoids. And these are also important uh, kind of characters in the, in the story. Uh, and these are just linear transformations or affine transformations of a ball. Um, so you take a ball, you apply uh, an affine transformation. Uh, and you get this kind of deformed uh, ellipse. Um, and these are sort of very, very nice. We understand lots about ellipsoids, um, and we will be using them to define norms and things like that uh, throughout the talk. OK, so what are the two kind of most basic lattice problems that one can think about in this context? So the first uh, is the shortest vector problem. Okay. And here, uh, you're given a norm 
um, and your goal is to find uh, the non-zero vector that is as short as possible with respect to your norm, right? So in this case, you know, you just think of like scaling up the norm ball until you hit the first non-zero vector, in this case it's y, uh, and the solution in this context of the shortest vector problem is either y or minus y. Um, but you could also imagine, and this, this will be important, solving approximate versions of this problem, where you don't exactly output the shortest guy, but you output, you know, the shortest guy within a factor of two, or possibly even much bigger factors that depend on the measure. Um, as we'll see later, this, this is one of the subroutines you can use to break IPs up into little, uh, uh, into, into lower dimensional problems. Um, and the closest vector problem uh, is sort of the same kind of uh, thing, except now we have like an additional target. So here this target uh, generically does not live inside the lattice, and your goal is to find the closest point in the lattice to you under uh, the sort of, uh, uh, I guess, not exactly norm, but gauge function induced uh, by k. And here you can see that it will be this point uh, y. All right. um, and this will be uh, essentially what's used for, for rounding uh, the center in, in, in IP. Um, now, uh, it, it turns out that, I mean, from the perspective of algorithms, um, we need s something about k not being too far away from being symmetric. So you should think that it's kind of centered, it's a relatively deep point in, 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 in inside uh, the body, that like around zero, this kind of point here is, is somewhat deep inside k. Um, this is a technical assumption, it's, it's necessary, but you, know, you should know that, that it's, it's needed, but it's uh, not that important in the context of the talk. Uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the factor that is always true? When you need zero in k, right? Yes. And what, so what do we have? Two to the n instead of three to the n? Or, or uh, yeah, so, so I put three to the n. Uh, so two to the n always exists. Um, some constant to the n will... Uh, ah, but, but zero is then the center. Zero is in the center. Zero is yes. the center. Yes. Zero is the center. Yes. Um, okay. So now I'm going to say, so when you're solving problems with the Euclidean norm, Right, so now everything is just standard L2 distance. There's been like a gigantic amount of work uh, on these problems. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, very briefly show you the kind of landscape. Sorry, of, can you go back to <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes, sorry. So here, this, you're always scaling from the center. Yes. Okay. You're always scaling from the center. And whether, so here in this context, you should think of the center as being zero. And with respect to zero, uh, the body is not too asymmetric. Okay, and then this way you hope to find an integer point that is deep inside. Yes, yes. Um, Do you have approximation algorithms for this kind of closed yes. vector problem? Yes, so I'll show it in, in one more slide. So I just want to say again that the starting point for a lot of this story uh, has been you know, solving um, all of these questions just when you're working with the Euclidean norm. Okay? Uh, and these are really the building blocks for everything. Um, and there's a surprising wealth of rather different types of algorithms for solving these problems. Um, and it all kind of started with the work of Leinster, Leinster, and Lovas, uh, who came up with the idea of basis reduction. And this is a way of starting with the basis of a lattice that may be crappy and kind of iteratively doing some sort of local search uh, to make it better in terms of making the basis vector shorter and shorter and shorter in some non-trivial way. Uh, but you can see that it achieves like exponential approximation factors. And it turns out that the moment you want to get like approximation factors that are close to one, uh, then for all of these problems, uh, the complexity seems to be exponential. Okay, and actually some of this is, is, is true under, you know, the exponential time hypothesis, but, but not, uh, uh, yes, no, so, uh, the, the, this is true under the, the, the exponential time hypothesis. Um, so anyway, you, you, you can see that uh, in the 80s we had sort of basis reduction style techniques, and then uh, rather later in the 2000s, 
Um, we had kind of an explosion of different types of techniques. Um, the one on the left is randomized sieving, and this is somehow like uh, you you sample like exponentially many uh, lattice vectors, and you try and like cluster them into groups uh, and make them shorter by taking differences uh, between the the cluster and the center of the cluster, and this will like iteratively allow you to make uh, vectors shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, and this was the first type of algorithm that actually gave a, a single exponential time algorithm for the shortest vector problem. Uh, and then we have algorithms that are based on uh, what's called the, the Voronoi cell of the lattice. Um, you'll see that uh, maybe a little bit a little bit later, which is again a completely different type. Uh, and then we have sampling based algorithms where we like exactly control the, the distribution of the uh, of the samples that we get that looks like a Gaussian, All right? So so it's quite a wide sort of variety of completely different algorithms, um, and uh, in the context of this talk, we needed versions of this or we want versions of this for more general things than L two, and we have versions of this uh, for essentially general norms um, using variants of the previous techniques. Um, so, uh, and I, I can even highlight there, there's been some quite recent progress. This is Fritz and his student, uh, Moritz Benson, uh, and Thomas uh, and his student have, have had some, some recent progress on improving uh, complexities for general norms. Uh, and what I want to talk to you a bit about today is um, just one of the base techniques here, okay, that uses a mixture of the Voronoi cell and a technique in convex geometry. Um, which is called the, the M, an M ellipsoid covering. Uh, and this will maybe fit the theme of adventures in lattices and convex geometry. And you'll see maybe a little bit about how that, how that fits together. Um, okay, so uh, I want to show you one of the tools that is quite versatile, uh, that is uh, sort of important for the IP story, but also allows you to solve all of these lattice problems. Um, or is a key tool for solving many of these lattice problems. Um, so this is just a generic technique for enumerating all the lattice points inside uh, a convex bar. So I have uh, a convex body K, I have a lattice. Um, I want to compute the entire intersection, um, but the budget that I'm going to give myself to compute the entire intersection is going to be somewhat big, but, but how big precisely is it? Um, and you could hope maybe that I could give myself a budget that is proportional to, you know, the number of lattice points inside this intersection. That turns out to be somewhat too optimistic, uh, just because, you know, this could have zero intersection with the lattice, right? So you, you won't be able to get uh, something that is uh, only dependent on the number of lattice points. Um, but what you can get is something that depends on the maximum number of lattice points this body can contain in any shift. Okay. And maybe the way you should think about that is that if I want to enumerate lattice points inside here, well, maybe I have to grab some of these guys, you know, because they're sort of close to the boundary and you would think that they, they might be relevant and be difficult for you to, to know that they're not relevant um, ahead of time. So this quantity really measures uh, you know, in some sense, it would probably be this shift in this context that would be the worst case that would have the maximum number of lattice points. Um, and that's the complexity that we'll go for. Okay? Uh, and you get, again, like some 2 to the n factor in front of that. So, uh, as I mentioned, this is like a key tool for solving all the lattice problems, and it's also like very important in the context of IP. So, I want to I wanna say uh, how this goes. Um, again, at a very, very high level. So we start uh, with our body K, and I want to compute like all of these points inside it, and I have this time budget. Again, this is this maximum number of lattice points it can contain in any translation. And so the high level idea is I'm going to sort of cover this body uh, by ellipsoids um, and reduce to enumerating all of the points uh, inside that cover. So let me first start by why it might be easier, or why it's kind of a bit magical that it's easier uh, to enumerate lattice points inside an ellipsoid. 
Uh, and because ellipsoids are just linear transformations of a ball, I can really assume that you know my ellipsoid is just the ball. Uh, and I kind of changed the lattice to adjust, to adjust for it. So here's a, a ball, it's centered at T, and I would like to compute uh, all of these, these lattice points. Um, so here's an idea that uh, uh, was, I mean, to some extent implicit uh, uh, in, in work on, on Voronoi style algorithms. So what, what can you do? So the first thing we do is we look at this tiling of space. And this tiling of space is induced by uh, what are called Voronoi cells. And what are the Voronoi cells? These are just all of the points. So this cell, or maybe this cell, are all of the points that are closer to uh, this lattice point than to any other. Okay. And this is a beautiful object. It gives you like a polytope. It has, um, uh, it turns out to have uh, at most two to the n or two times two to the n facets. Um, and it gives you this kind of face-to-face -face tiling um, of space. And from this face-to-face -face tiling, you can, in, you can build a graph. Uh, so basically, when any two tiles share uh, a facet, you can connect them by an edge. Um, and uh, the, the kind of Voronoi-based algorithms for, for, for L2 uh, problems essentially compute all of the uh, edges of this graph. And they're always the same. So like no matter where you are, the edges are just uh, translations of the previous edges. Um, so I only need to compute these kind of uh, uh, edges for one tile. Uh, and they're computable in four to the n tile. And now what you can do is, OK, you, you, you have this graph. And now I can just uh, take the induced subgraph with respect to the ball. All right, so this is a shifted ball. Um, and what is absolutely magical is that in this context, doesn't matter where you shift the ball, the induced subgraph is always connected. Okay. Uh, and essentially, the reason why it's connected is because these edges always allow you to get closer to the center of the ball. So, like, if I'm a distance five, and there is always going to be one edge that takes me a distance, you know, if I'm at distance five from t, there's always going to be one edge that takes me a bit closer until I get to the closest one. And in this case, it's this guy. Okay. So if you think about that for a second, it kind of tells you if you follow the kind of edge that takes you closer, you kind of get this directed tree that's pointing towards the center of the ball that is induced by these, this kind of subgraph of the, the Voronoi graph. Um, and so uh, it turns out that, that you have this kind of lo locally computable tree. And using this locally computable tree, you can find everybody uh, inside the ball. Um, and this is very efficient. It's basically like, I need to find, I mean, relatively, of course, I need to find the, the, the closest uh, point to the center t. So that's, uh, I think this uh, is this one. So this is t, this is the closest point. And then I can kind of, uh, enumerate through this tree in reverse uh, and find everybody inside. Um, and this is essentially output. Uh, I mean, the complexity of this is like 2 to the order n plus the number of, of lattice points inside here times the number of edges. So it's, it's, it's actually quite, quite good. Um, and so now we know how to enumerate points inside balls, uh, i.e. the same for ellipsoids. Um, and we, we want to use that, amplify that, uh, to enumerate uh, inside of a, a convex set. And so here I'm writing covering. Um, and you could ask, you know, why instead of covering, shouldn't I just take like uh, a reasonable ellipsoid that just contains uh, my, my feasible region? And the reason that you don't do that, or at least the reason that's less efficient, is that you know, uh, even the, the smallest ellipsoid that contains my feasible region could have way, way larger volume. And in particular, in n dimensions, it can be up to sort of n to the n bigger. Um, and like a very easy example is just take the L1 ball versus the L2 ball, and you do some computations and you see that the difference in volumes is indeed like n to the n. So it turned out to be much more efficient to use a covering rather than just one uh, ellipsoid. 
Um, and from here, what you get uh, is the, 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 the following kind of structure. Um, so there is a, a beautiful theorem in convex geometry, which is about the existence of a certain type of ellipsoid. Uh, and what does this uh, magical ellipsoid satisfy? It satisfies that for the body K, uh, a single exponential number of translates. So there's some constant here that's independent of dimension. Uh, that's in the big O, uh, so that's that's important. Um, that are uh, needed uh, to cover K. So these are uh, just shifts of the same ellipsoid, and the same thing the other way around. Um, so there's only a single exponential number of shifts of the convex body K that are needed to cover the ellipsoid. So in some sense, they have roughly the same uh, size and volume, um, but only in the context of coverage. Um, and once you have this, uh, I mean, to some extent, the algorithm is, uh, well, straightforward, at least in a, in a high level sense. Um, so first, you have to somehow compute this M ellipsoid. This turns out to be too bulk. Uh, you have to cover the body K by uh, uh, shifts of the M ellipsoid. It turns out that you can kind of replace the ellipsoid by a parallel piped. Uh, it doesn't lose you too much in terms of uh, single exponential factors. Um, and then you, you basically now are tiling uh, uh, K with these uh, parallel pipettes. Um, and this tiling is easy to compute. Okay. Um, and it's actually of the same form as, um, you, it's, it's another kind of lattice point enumeration problem. Um, so, so you can think that this tiling is, is somehow easy to compute using the ideas uh, from the Voronoi cell stuff, but it's, it's actually simpler. Um, and now you have all of this uh, covering, um, and you're going to uh, use the techniques that we know uh, to compute all of the integer points inside each of these ellipsoids, uh, and then you're just going to keep the ones that live inside. And if you think about it, the covering properties are exactly where you get uh, that, you know, none of the ellipsoids have more points in them than uh, K might have in the worst case shift. Um, and if you sort of multiply everything together, you, the complexity of computing this is kind of proportional to the worst case number of lattice points K can contain in any transition. Okay, so that's uh, every, everything I'm going to say about uh, uh, Sort of lattice algorithms. Daniel, can I ask? Yes. Uh, so, so first of all, how do you how do you compute this M ellipsoid? Is this again a semi-definite program, or is this? Uh, no. So, so we don't know how to. We don't. Well, okay, it's not entirely true. The, there is no obviously easy to compute semi-definite program uh, that gives you the M ellipsoid. Turns out there is a geodesically convex program, but okay, whatever the hell that means. Um, but uh, the, 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 the constructions are uh, involved, <laughs> is all I will say. Uh, they, they're, quite, they're quite involved. Like the, the original one is somehow you kind of iteratively apply transformations that take K and transform it into an ellipsoid. Uh, in log star n number of iterations, uh, it's a bit, it's a, it's a bit involved. And 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 uh, so this m ellipsoid has these two properties, right? You don't need too many translates of the ellipsoid to cover k, and also the other way around. Yes. So so can you just repeat where you need uh, where you need like do you really need both directions? Yes. So uh, the the second property is basically to make sure that. The, the, the fact that K, let's say, what I, what I showed you um, here is more, I only use the fact that an exponential number of copies of the ellipsoid cover K. Yeah. But if you want a runtime guarantee, you kind of need to know that those ellipsoids don't contain too many lattice points in them. Yeah. And for that, use the fact that each of those ellipsoids is covered by an exponential number of translates of K. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. That yeah, yeah, that's easy. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. All right, so uh, now I want to shift and go back to uh, IP, and I want to take uh, the view of IP, which will look at it through the lens of a, a duality relationship 
uh, for the covering radius. For that, I have to tell you what the covering radius is. Um, and so, given a body, so think about this is the feasible region for our IP. Uh, the covering radius is uh, the minimum scaling of the body such that every shift of it intersects the lattice. So, um, every shift of it after scaling uh, uh, by the covering radius will contain the lattice. And the, the S here is the minimal scale. And so here you can see, okay, I shifted K, it doesn't intersect lattice points, so the covering radius uh, is a bit bigger than one, I have to scale up. Um, and uh, in fact, the covering radius in this case is exactly two. Okay. Um, and a, a completely equivalent way of defining it, uh, this is just a little bit of algebraic manipulation, um, is that sort of if you add uh, uh, the, the, the convex body to, to, to the lattice, so you, you, you place a, a, ver a copy of it around each lattice point, uh, then you have to cover all of space. So it has to equal uh, Rn, and in this case, R2. Okay. Uh, and of course, the nothing, I mean, I did this with the integers, but you could do this with a general lattice. Uh, it doesn't change um, you know, the meaning. Um, and uh, uh, one nice thing is, uh, I mean, geometrically compared to you know the objects we saw before, if I look at uh, the covering radius with respect to uh, L two, so with respect to L two distance, this has like a, a cute interpretation, which is that um, what you're basically trying to do is find the smallest ball uh, which contains the whole of the Voronoi cell. So it's actually uh, the kind of vertex of the Voronoi cell with largest norm is exactly the covering radius. You just uh, kind of connect uh, to geometric objects we see. Uh, and so now let's, let's talk about uh, IP again. So just to remind ourselves, we're trying to find an integer point uh, inside K or decide that none exists. Um, and so how does the covering radius play into this picture? So uh, if the covering radius is small, Right? What it sort of tells me is that uh, every shift of k you know, does contain an integer point. Uh, so in some sense, IP here should be trivial. If the covering radius is sort of strictly less than 1, uh, then I should always say yes. Um, but in fact, we're going to use something quantitative, uh, which is what if the covering radius is like you know, less than a half as opposed to just strictly less than 1? What does this kind of give us? It gives us that you know you can choose your, your sort of favorite center of your of your convex body, um, and even if you scale down by half uh, around the center, you still know that you contain lattice points. Okay, so you should think of these points here as like deep lattice points inside my body, um, and this will be true as I said, no matter where uh, you translate uh, your body. Um, and now, using uh, you can use this observation um, to sort of show that you can apply the lattice algorithms that, that we talked about before to find integer points. Um, and in particular, you know what lattice algorithm should you do? You should take sort of the two approximate closest vector call with respect to uh, you know the body being. Uh, the shift of the body with respect to the center that you've chosen. Um, and so you're scaling about uh, the center. Um, and you know that uh, there, there is a, a, a lattice point inside sort of this one half scaling. So if you take a two approximate solution, which uh, we can compute in two to the order n time, um, that'll live inside a one scaling of your body, which means it'll be inside the body. So maybe this is the closest guy, you won't find the closest guy, you'll find one up to a factor of two. Uh, but that's uh, all well and good because this is feasible, this solves the problem. Um, and you can choose the center C so that we satisfy this near symmetry condition that I mentioned before. In particular, you can choose the center of gravity of K that will work. Um, so th th this basically says, you know, if the covering radius is, is uh, small, like a little bit smaller than one, um, I, can, I can solve uh, IP in two to the order n time. 
So the problem is the other side. Okay, so what if the covering radius uh, uh, isn't small? What if it's uh, bigger than half? So if the covering radius is bigger than a half, um, this is where this like second part of the dichotomy needs to happen. We're going to need to break the problem up uh, into lower dimensional pieces and recurse. Uh, and exactly how you do this is sort of the question. Um, and so now I, I want to go back uh, and sort of take it from the perspective that many people will have seen it uh, uh, before in the context of lattice free sets, which I talked about at the beginning. Um, and so uh, if you have lattice free sets, I'll connect this to, to the covering radius in, in, in a second. Um, what we know is that is that these sets should be should be flat in some sense. They can't be big in every possible direction. Um, and so, how has this classically been view, viewed? It's been viewed in the context of uh, sort of decomposing um, um, you know this set into a small number of uh, parallel kind of lattice hyperplanes. Um, and so here, I mean, this set in fact intersects. You can find a a set of uh, hyperplanes where this set intersects none of them, uh, which in some sense is great. Um, and you can find for every you know, different lattice free convex set, you can find sort of a different set of hyperplanes that has a small number uh, of intersections. Okay, uh, so let's connect lattice freeness uh, to, uh, to, to covering radius being big. Um, so just to see that in some sense, uh, lattice freeness is, a, is an easy thing to say, but it's really kind of directly related to the covering radius, which is that sort of if the covering radius is big, in our case we were talking about one half, um, there is a scaling and a shifting of k that doesn't contain uh, lattice points. Yes? Can you quickly repeat on lattice freeness? Sorry? Can you quickly repeat on lattice freeness? Uh, there are no lattice points in the, in the interior of your set. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, so uh, if the covering radius is bigger than a half, it turns out that you know, there is, uh, I can scale k by exactly one half uh, and shift it uh, such that there are no lattice points uh, that are inside the interior of k. Um, and so, so this is related to the fact that my dichotomy was thinking about one half or greater than one half, um, but um, um, you can easily convince yourself of the, the sort of following proposition that, you know, there is a shift of k that is lattice free if and only if the covering radius is greater than 1. Okay, so this 1 half versus greater than 1 half, whatever. Uh, so, so lattice freeness is very directly related to, to uh, uh, the covering radius, but the covering radius is kind of, from the perspective of the algorithm, the correct shift invariant quantity to be thinking about. Um, okay. So uh, let's think now about how do we like measure number of hyperplanes. So this is um, going towards um, um, Stefan's uh, question about you know counting hyperplanes and, and this notion of flatness. Um, so what what should I do if I if I uh, uh, have a non-zero vector, right? So if I have a non-zero integer vector, I can break up space uh, according to the integer inner products of that vector, in this case it's the uh, uh, x1 direction. Um, so uh, if I have a general body, um, like how many points uh, uh, am I going to, to uh, how many hyperplanes are going to intersect this body um, if I pick this, this direction? So the first thing to look at, and this is sort of a continuous relaxation, turns out to be the sort of width of the body with respect to the direction. So what, what, what you do when you're computing width is that you sort of uh, maximize the inner product with respect to y over k, and you get this, uh, this line associated with the maximizer. You minimize, you get this line associated with the minimizer, so you get 7.2 and 1.9, uh, and your width is exactly the difference between these two numbers, right? So 7.2 minus 1.9. Um, so that's in some sense a continuous relaxation, and to make that a bit more precise, notice that like if I were exactly going to count this number of hyperplanes, so this is five hyperplanes in this context, um, 
And it's exactly like all of the integers that live in between the min and the max. That's, that's exactly this number two, these numbers two, three, four, five, six. Um, you, you can exactly express this, you know, using rounding up and rounding down. Um, and just with sort of one inequality where you have like an off by one thing going on, uh, you get that the number of hyperplanes is at most a width rounded down plus one. So, so width is a very good sort of continuous relaxation of like the number of hyperplanes that, that uh, intersect K. Um, and uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about decomposing, you know, your IP into like one lower dimensional um, um, subproblems, you know, this is, the, you would exactly want to compute the integer direction of like minimum width. Um, and, uh, what you can notice is that, you know, width is in fact a norm. Uh, I mean, don't worry about what the body is associated with the, 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 the width norm, but it is a norm. Yes? Um, okay, so I will, I will get to the kind of uh, conjecture again, and then we will, we will stop. Um, so width does define a norm. Um, and computing this minimum width direction is exactly like a closest vector, sorry, a shortest vector solve uh, with respect to the lattice Zn, which um, is in some sense the dual lattice in this context, uh, and uh, uh, the norm induced by the width of k. Right? And this is exactly computable using the lattice algorithms we saw before. Um, so now the question is, what, you know, what, what does this give you? Uh, so I want to write what this gives you in terms of a duality relation. Um, and what you should think is that essentially this width and the covering radius are kind of inversely proportional to each other. Um, so if the width is big, so your body is big, then the covering radius should be small. You know, vice versa, if the covering radius is very, very uh, small, the body must be big, so the width must be big. Um, and in fact, if I multiply these two together, uh, you can easily see that there, that there is a lower bound, and this is, getting to this like approximate min-max relation. Uh, so what happens here is that when I multiply these two, you can think of just factoring the covering radius, sorry, factoring the width into the covering radius, and it factors sort of inversely. So now here, what you should think is I have a, a body here of a lattice width exactly one, uh, and I want to say here that the covering radius must be at least one. Uh, and the reason this is the case is because of this picture. Just like this is the minimum width direction, I, uh, uh, K has lattice width one, so it, it can be shifted so that it is exactly between these two hyperplanes. Uh, and so I have to, um, if I scale it down just a little bit, then it doesn't contain any integer points. Um, now, the highly non-trivial side uh, and the highly non-trivial thing is that there is in fact an upper bound on this duality relation. Um, and this is completely equivalent to this flatness theorem that people may have uh, heard of previously, which is that um, if I have a lattice free convex set, then its lattice width is upper bound by a function that depends only on dimension. And the best function that we have so far is this kind of n to the four thirds, it's sort of polynomial in n. Um, uh, that was given by Rudelson. Um, and it turns out to exactly be equivalent to an upper bound in this duality relation. So if you want to understand the covering radius, um, it's sort of controlled by the width within a factor of n to the four thirds, roughly. Okay? Um, so, okay, anyway, there's been lots of work uh, on, on understanding this. Uh, it, it, Covering radius, uh, this, this relation between covering radius and, and width is off by at least a factor of n, but we don't know that, uh, uh, we don't know that, uh, how to prove that in general. Um, and uh, it gives you exactly this kind of uh, dichotomy that, that we were mentioning before, and I'll, I'll explain how to generalize it. So, I mean, this dichotomy is exactly, you know, either it's easy to find an integer point or uh, I can decompose my problem into a small number of pieces and recurse. 
So uh, it turns out that if you do this with the best things that we know uh, from this flatness theorem, you're actually going to get a bigger complexity bound that I mentioned uh, that, I, the, that is the best known complexity bound. You get essentially n to the four thirds n as opposed to n to the n, right? And so the question is, where did the improvement come from? How, how can one do better? And this is where uh, this canonical loss conjecture comes in. Um, so what's the, what's the problem um, in terms of complexity is that in this framework, we're only trying to get rid of one dimension at a time. And so recursion, you know, one dimension at a time is not necessarily the best thing you can do. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's essentially related to the fact that it's very easy to enumerate integer points uh, inside of an interval, and that's what people knew how to do previously. Um, but what, what do we also know how to do? So this is the theorem I showed you at the beginning. Um, another time that we know how to inter uh, um, compute integer points uh, or enumerate integer points efficiently um, is when we know that, you know, the worst case number of integer points in any translation is small. Um, that's the theorem that I showed you in the, 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 the lattice algorithm section. Um, and this is something that you can also use in this context. Um, but how exactly would you use it? Um, so the way you would use it is um, in sort of, instead of trying to get rid of one dimension at a time, so which corresponds to uh, this kind of integer projection matrix, but where there's only one row, I'm going to try and get rid of many dimensions at a time, so d dimensions at a time. And if I try and get rid of d dimensions at a time, it turns out that the, the sub-problems uh, that I, I want to solve are all exactly in correspondence with integer points inside the projection of my convex body. Uh, but this now, in, this is two-dimensional, so if I can enumerate these sort of very quickly, let's say in, you know, uh, if this was d-dimensional, if I could enumerate these in two to the d time, um, I would my amortized cost per dimension would be two. Okay. Um, so I have the tool to, to essentially do this kind of stuff, but I need to know like how big uh, uh, this number is going to be in the worst case, um, and that's exactly where this sort of canonical loss conjecture comes in. Um, so. Uh, uh, Okay, I'm going to just uh, skip to here. So the important point is that in the in in the case where you know this becomes uh, interesting or relevant, it turns out that the sort of worst case number of integer points that I can contain in any translation um, is essentially the same as volume. Um, like volume and the number of integer points is essentially the same thing. So I can just focus on minimizing. The volume that I get from these, this normalized volume that I get from these projections. Um, as I mentioned before, the sort of one dimensional case turns out to exactly be uh, lattice width. Um, and uh, all right, let me just get to it. Yes. So uh, this is what Kanan and Lobos uh, proved, and then their conjecture is sort of the next step. So what they proved is that uh, this duality still holds when you replace width by this kind of crazy, you know, minimum volume projection uh, quantity. Um, and it holds with a much better, uh, like, right-hand side. So the right-hand side is n as opposed to n to the four-thirds. Uh, and the fact, the proof of this is much simpler than the proof of the original flatness theorem. Um, and this is what I used in my, um, uh, in my algorithm. Because the proof that they give of this fact turns out to be constructive enough to give you an algorithm, um, and uh, it's uh, 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 when you put it all together, the kind of duality dichotomy that you get is essentially what what, what tells you that at every subproblem you, you or at every stage you create n subproblems per dimension, and when you put it together, you get an n to the n algorithm. Um, and the conjecture, which is what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, is that that n should be log. Okay. Uh, and the tight example is the is this kind of simplex where you scale like every coordinate uh, uh, slightly differently. Um, 
And uh, uh, so that, that's the conjecture. And just to, to close, the, the evidence that we have towards the conjecture, like why you know, should we believe that, that this has some hope of being true, uh, is that it's actually true sort of for ellipses. Okay, and this is like a whole other, uh, like, uh, uh, I mean, it was a lot of work to, to, uh, to, to, to show this. I mean, due to myself and Regev and Noah Stevens to um, uh, and, and this gives us some hope uh, that's, that this conjecture is, is actually true. Uh, and it relates to lots of deep things uh, about sort of reversing one of the implications or finding a converse of Minkowski's first theorem and all sorts of things like that, but I don't have time uh, to describe it. Uh, and uh, in fact, you can even extract useful things from this for the, the context of, of IP in the sense that um, we know this theorem is true for ellipsoids, uh, which also means it's true for general lattices with the Euclidean norm. Um, and uh, uh, the algorithms that we have that kind of enable this theorem would also improve uh, the complexity of IP if you knew the kanan Mobos conjecture was true, um, but we don't. All right, so that's, that's all I wanted to say, so I'll, I'll stop.